Hi, I'm Nermin, content creator and food blogger. Our struggle is the survivor guide of others. This is the wisdom that Andrea has embraced. Today at Chain Ermin, I welcome my exceptional guest, Andrea Anderson, the U.S. wellness coach, holistic nutritionist, and breast cancer survivor herself. Andrea will share with us today her most valuable lessons learned to help us claim a life free of pain and inflammation. Thank you so much, Andrea, for being my guest. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here today. It's an honor to have you. So before we tackle our subject today, which is a path free of pain, I want you to tell us more about your own battle, the good fight that you had in your life uh, with, with a disease that carved your passion and mission today. Okay. So please tell us more about it. Okay. Um, so back in 2015, I actually was diagnosed uh, with stage 2B, stage 3 breast cancer while I was 30 weeks pregnant. And obviously, um, it was a, a very uh, a kind of a rock bottom moment. And it really was an experience that really brought me to my knees on many different levels, because not only are we fighting the the disease aspects of cancer, the fear, the grief, the um, unknown, plus decision-making around chemicals. Um, but I was also pregnant. <clears throat> and then also on top of it, having to try to figure out, you know, how do I take an action to change my diet and change my lifestyle? Number one, so I, I can kind of fight through all these horrific treatments but also so that I don't get cancer again, because there's a lot of misinformation around, I'm cancer free and you never get it again. And what we're finding now is actually, if in the absence of changing anything about your diet and lifestyle, a high probability that you will get a recurrence of it. So I, I was aware of this information through my own reading and research at the time. So it was this experience too really chaotic and you know, traumatic experiences and the crisis around it, where I knew I had to change my diet. That was a given. I, I could no longer eat the way I used to eat with high processed foods and sugar and caffeine and all that. And I had to do more with eating anti-cancer foods, but I didn't know how to get there. So the, what I like to call the kind of the quest to change and the journey to, to change how I ate took me about nine to 10 months. And it was in that experience I almost describe it as being more difficult than battling cancer with the cancer treatments because you have more structure and you know what you got to do every day of the week for the cancer treatments. But with changing food and diet, not knowing what foods to make, how to make it, um, and will they even taste somewhat satisfying, you know? So it was in that experience of overwhelm with not who, how to start, what what to cook or make is really my, my why around what I do today. I realized that was so difficult with changing diet and, and changing lifestyle and having this broader awareness around what it means to live in a healthy way. And that's what kind of going through that difficulty around changing diet for recovery and repair is what propelled me into to doing what it is I do now. Um, helping other women to figure out what step to actually start regaining their health. So uh, Andrea, you said you, uh, you were diagnosed during your pregnancy. So how long was your uh, cancer battle? Uh, I was, I had a real aggressive treatment plan. So when I started in May and I finished in February, which included, you know, the rounds of chemo, I gave birth in between, then I had to resume chemo, then I did a double mastectomy and reconstructive surgery, and then I had to go into uh, radiation in at the, actually the, the Christmas months, the holiday months through February. So it was a very my objective was I want to get through this as fast as possible so my son has no med the 
the illness. So your objective, I'm going to repeat this because for some reason it, uh, it froze. Oh, so okay. you want to go as quickly as possible through this. So your son would not have a memory of your battle. So after the battle ended, you had a, uh, a newborn, basically. Am I right? Correct. Like a yes. few months old. That's and then, right. Did you have another child or that was your only child back then? That was my only child because you go into uh, chemo-induced menopause after you go through the treatments. Okay. So you had one child or you have one child. And by the time you were over with your treatment, uh, you tell me about the transformation. You are an ex-corporate girl. You have, mm -hmm. I believe, 20 years of experience. Correct. Tell us more about your transformation from an ex-corporate girl to an entrepreneur, the nutritionist you are today. Okay, great. That's a fabulous question. So when I went through my, uh, the cancer experience, and I, I say that term because it really was a spiritual journey of really reflecting on my life and what was important to me, how do I want to live the next chapter? And I, I would often sit on the couch when I was going through my cancer treatments even, and I would look out the window and I would really be doing a lot of reflection, self-reflection, a lot of spiritual uh, work. And I remember when I got back out workforce, back into my corporate job, I remember I just, I couldn't do it. I had no passion. I it just seemed so insignificant to worry about certain things that were in the work environment yeah. after everything I had been through. So that's when I started again, moving into this diff different direction. What can I do to take all that I learned personally around disease, how difficult it is to change your diet and lifestyle? How could I actually make that a career? And that at that point, that's when I actually became certified as a health and wellness coach and I started my business officially, Nutrition Commission, back in 2018. And I started helping certain individual clients with um, a new, you know, numerous things that they had uh, with weight or metabolic issues and, and things like that. But then I knew I wanted to go even deeper. I, I, I pretty much at that point, because my, my mind and my spirit, and my passion just was not in that old world, I knew I was all in. I, I wanted to do this for my career and literally change. Um, after spending, you know, 20, 25 years in this other space, I was like, this is where my passion lies. And it, it's more, uh, it, it really is a reflection of who I am now. So I became, I, I invested in myself and I, I went back into school and selected some, um, nutrition programs to where I could actually become a holistic nutritionist. And it's um, basically where I'm, I'm in learning everything I can about functional nutrition and the way the body works and how food affects different parts of our, our body and our systems. And then also the therapeutic side of nutrition. So it allowed me to really go nation and that knowledge to actually start doing um, a little bit more complicated work with women who are suffering with illnesses or conditions um, and being able to really help them to find relief and again, regain their health. So that's really the way it shifted for me. I knew my passion was in this whole new area and, in, and I was so dedicated to it that after trying to work as a side job in my, my side business here, and I was still doing corporate work for about a year and a half, I finally made the decision late last year where I was so miserable. I, I was miserable working in corporate world. I knew that that wasn't, again, I was dead. It just, it was like, I don't want to be here. <laughs> it was like, really talk about not being, um, you know, aligned with what you want to do for, for your day job. But it was, I realized like, Andrea, if I stay in this, okay, okay I kind of, I know what, I know, I know that I'm going to be in the same place I am today. So I, at that point, something really clicked for me. And I realized like, not, if, if I don't take a, a leap of faith, if I don't 
believe in myself, if I don't take that step, then, and just stay with what I'm doing with this cushy job or this cushy salary, I can pretty much see my future and I'm going to be more miserable a year from now. Um, maybe even more depressed, who knows, you know, just mentally not the person I want to be. And so I realized like, okay, I, there's no time now. I can't do this. I can't waste another year of my life. So I started the year making a decision that I was going to leave my job and I'm going to sell my house and I'm going to, I'm going to just go for it. And, um, and that's essentially what I did. And it was probably the most liberating feeling of my life when I realized that, you know, life is short, you know, when you face your own mortality, which I did, you know, you face your own mortality, you realize um, if I keep waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for the right time, it'll never happen for you. You have to go take it. And that's what I, the decision that I made. And, um, and I, of course, you know, we all have our dark moments thinking, what have I done? But for the most part, you know, I'm uh, way happier. I noticed immediately when I took control and I felt like I was so empowered that um, I made a decision and I didn't, I, it wasn't a, a rash one either. I sat on it for about a year and a half, but um, it was freeing. It truly was freeing. And then knowing you kind of move into your own space of happiness because you've made a decision that's more aligned with what it is you really want to do and you're passionate about. That sounds great. But I, I have a quick question here. What did you learn in your previous job that is useful for you today in your current job that you are so passionate about? Oh, gosh. Uh, my, my 25 years of work history prepared me for um, all the fun, uh, unexpected events that happen with entrepreneurship. So you have to be uh, focused. You have to be well organized. Uh, you also have to understand what you have to prioritize. Definitely, you can get really distracted with a lot of what I like to say the shiny toys over here and over there. But I think my 25 years of experience has really helped me with understanding how to sift through the noise, the, the noise of multiple distractions and stay focused on what's the most important um, task at hand. Uh, especially when you're trying to start a business, which is at the end of the day, I know I don't have to have everything 100% perfect. And my favorite saying became, done is better than perfect. And, and it's really important when we're trying to start a new, uh, anything really, any new adventure, any, any new business to just stay focused on setting a goal that's long-term, but then breaking it down into manageable um, tasks and staying focused and committed that nothing is going to take me off that line. I mean, I, that's, I have to hit that goal and everything else can get pushed off, but you have to be true to what you're trying to get done and make sure you honor those timelines as best as you can. Excellent. So now let's talk about your expertise. Tell us about the food that are accused um, uh, or are behind pain, aggravation of pain and inflammation? Love this question. Um, so it's not always the most popular thing, but essentially when you think about all of the um, inflammatory or trigger foods, they're basically the processed foods. <laughs> so you can also look at anything that we eat that's got this coming out of a box has been processed. And, it's, and whether that, that could mean that it's been um, heated, cooked, it's, they've added additional ingredient or additives um, or chem basically chemicals in the food. So our best bet to always eat, always eat whole foods. But we also have to think about the types of oils that we use for cooking, believe it or not. So if we think about vegetable oils and cooking and rancidity of the oil bec becomes very inflammatory. So we think about removing sugars rancid oils or vegetable oils and being mindful of what temperature the oil can be used at for different cooking methods is really important. Gluten, okay? Gluten is also highly inflammatory for most people, believe it or not. Um, that's only because we have a lot of other uh, triggers and stressors that affect the body. But we also have to look at conventional meats. Otherwise, you, know, you could think about 
beef or any meat that has not been um, raised with grass fed diets is inflammatory. On the contrary, anything that's been organic or grass fed is anti-inflammatory. People don't realize that eating organic grass fed meat is actually good for us. It's the conventional, it's the hormones that they pump into the food, it's the chemicals, the sugar, the glutens. Um, those are the types of trigger foods that we have to steer, uh, steer away from if we're trying to make sure as a first step that we're um, avoiding those inflammatory foods. So uh, my understanding, okay, let me go through uh, those types of food again. You said, uh, first of all, oils. Uh, the oil. So it, do you have it a, um, a certain preference? If I want to fry something or shallow fry or cook in a, in a, yes. in a, um, a wok, what kind, what kind of oil should I be using? Gotcha. Right now? Okay. So when we are cooking high temperature, uh, the best bet is either using like a clarified butter, like ghee. Yes. Or we could use um, even avocado oil. Um, another option for um, coconut oil, um, extra virgin olive oil obviously should actually not be used for any um, kind of stovetop cooking method. It's great for just salads and cold dishes, or you can um, use it for um, cooking up to, to about 350 degrees. Uh, but other than that, you're you really want to make sure you're avoiding um, also any oils that are in uh, light clear bottles because that uh, obviously breaks down and becomes rancid and inflammatory more uh, quickly than the darker bottles, for example. Okay, so we stay away from olive oil when it comes to vigorous cooking. We Correct. stick with coconut to avocado oil and clarified butter. Okay, excellent. So uh, let's talk a little bit about dairy because I know it's very confusing. Are dairy, uh, dairy products, they cause inflammation? Dairy, that, yes. And so if we're eating organic grass-fed dairy, it is going to be better for you than or the conventional dairy. So the reason why this is important now, portions, the serving size also becomes important because everything in balance is, is okay. But if we're eating a diet that's high in a lot of dairy products, like hard cheeses or a lot of milk or a lot of yogurts, but we're not eating vegetables or um, balanced healthy proteins, you know, it, it becomes inflammatory. So everything in balance is okay. But when it comes to dairy, yes, we want to make sure we're, we're eating grass-fed and organic foods only. And if you, you know, if, if you can't and you're eating conventional, this is where the mindfulness has to come in because they're conventionally um, fed uh, dairy cows, obviously, um, are, are actually exposed to chemicals and genetically modified foods in their diet. And that's what we ultimately end up taking in is the hormones, the genetically modified foods, the antibiotics that the cows are getting. So that's another reason why we want to steer away from that type of, of um, sourced foods, basically. And that helps us with keeping our inflammation down. Okay, so dairy is fine. I mean, in itself, it doesn't cause inflammation. It's no. the conventional dairy, the non-organic that is... Uh, it's packed with hormones and additives that could That's cause right. inflammation. But dairy right. in itself, it does it's not. It's good for us. It's good for us. It, it, regardless our age, you know, because I heard in the past 40s, dairies are strongly um, uh, like advised against, basically. No, it's... It's, um, it's not bad for us really at any age. It's again, in, in, con in context that you're eating a balanced diet, we need, we need some, you know, it's good to have some dairy in your diet as a protein and even as a healthy fat source, that's okay. It's just thinking about, we don't wanna have more than maybe, uh, if I'm eating like hard cheese, I might have just, you know, um, 
like a two ounce size. And I, I'm going to just give you like a little circle here, you know, this or, you know, a small piece, but we're not making it the main event. We're not making dairy the main attraction of our plate. It's, it's really kind of that for taste, we add a little bit of cheese in, we might add, add a little bit of milk on in our oatmeal, um, you know, or, or something to that effect. But yeah, we're not making it the main event in our diet. So it should be a parcel of our diet. It should not be our main diet. And no. I remember um, I read in a nutrition uh, book that our consumption of cheese a day should not exceed 75 grams. Do you agree with that? I'm not too great with the metric conversion, but yeah, I would say um, that's why I'm trying to give you a visual. Um, you know, if I'm doing cheese, it's it's not going to be that much. It's I mean, a hard cheese, you know, a piece of sliver, you know, is fine. Um, but yeah, you're not eating like a half a cup or a, a cup of cheese or dairy products per se a day. Okay. So let's, let's say I've been to an event, there was a nice cheese platter, I ate more than I should uh, from that platter, and then I need to detox. What's your go-to detox, food or drinks for us? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> first, the first reminder would be not to beat ourselves up. <laughs> um, but probably the next day, I would just focus on eating more green vegetables, to be honest with you. You know, um, just balance. It's all about our balance. And we, we don't have to feel like we, you know, we now have to go into total restriction. It's just about maybe the next few days, you don't have as much dairy and you just increase your amount of green vegetables that you're going to eat. Very well. So that would take me to the following question. Like we as, as families and moms and, and parents in general nowadays, we are struggling and we're juggling too much given the ongoing situation of the pandemic. We're homeschooling, we're working from home. So how do you plan? You're working, you have a home-based business and you have a five-year-old son. So how do you find time for cooking healthy food? Because in similar situation, the easiest thing would be like ordering food or takeaways. Right which are packed with everything you advise against. So what right. do you do? Give up some tips. Sure. Um, that's a great question. And I have found that in, I, I like to be very whimsical. I don't meal prep for the week. I don't create a menu or a, a menu for the week or anything like that. I have gotten into a rhythm of basically buying the same foods weekly. So like most of us, we all have our go-to recipes and the things that we make just because that's what we've always cooked or, the, or you know, that's just what we make as, as, as food. So what I do is I just keep it really simple. I think about, I have a um, kind of my list of proteins that I eat, okay? So I, I might have lamb, I might have grass-fed beef, I might have some wild-caught salmon, I might have some scallops, whatever that, that's my protein. So I always think about all I'm going to do is create a protein and I'm going to make some vegetables. That's literally how I approach it. So I'll have to make it really simple and I will, I'll cook some, I'll cook my protein. So let's say I'm, I want to make some chicken thighs and it's simple, simple Mediterranean seasoning where I'm doing oregano, sea salt, um, maybe a dash of pepper, maybe some other spices, you know, but I keep it super basic. And then I'll say, okay, well, what, what two vegetable dishes do I want to throw together? Well, okay, maybe I'll do some steamed Brussels sprouts. And maybe, maybe I feel like doing a little bit more extra cooking. So maybe I'll roast some cauliflower and that'll be it. And then I'll garnish it with some you know, maybe, maybe I'll have some sauerkraut, so some fermented foods. I might add in some olives. I might add in a little bit of goat cheese. So I think about just the main simple dish. And I always try to make my plate, half my plate is always, a, is always vegetables. And then the quarter of my plate is protein. And then I embellish and I garnish and I add flavors and textures. And that's the way I keep it simple. And it, it's usually a less than 30 minutes I've got from beginning to end, you know, plates on the table and everybody's eating. And that's, 
how I have managed to keep that stress around the cooking side of things to a minimal now. So your tips are basically uh, keep it simple. Yeah. Provide almost the same protein and the same vegetables every uh, time you go food shopping, but yes. you mix and match. And you try to uh, amp up the flavors with some, I, exactly I like to right. call them cooking acids. Some seeds, some oils, sauerkraut, condiments. And this is how you put your meal together. So exactly right. your cooking time, it doesn't exceed 30 minutes no. on any day from no. start to finish. Wonderful. That's right. Yeah. And that's, and that's what has worked for me. And thankfully my son, I mean, he, he eats what I've been cooking him since he was a baby, you know, and he, he loves it. And, you know, so I'll rotate in different veggies and try to get, you know, keep working on his palate as a kid, you know, um, but chard and of course, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, bok choy. So any different greens that I can throw into the rotation, radishes, um, you know, beets, sweet potatoes from time to time. Um, yeah, and just try to pepper, you know, bell pepper, you name it, and just any a different flavor profile. Um, and it's just, I love to keep it simple. And I got a lot of that I learned from my, my mother-in-law who's Greek and the simplicity of the food, uh, which when I was going through cancer, that's who really inspired me to adopt this way of eating. And I ever, ever since I was like, wow, this is so easy. I had no idea how easy, but flavorful, flavorful and satisfying the simplicity, the simplicity of the dish could be. So yes, yeah, it's true. totally, it's, it's doable. Excellent. So um, if you have one precious tip to share with women who are fighting cancer or even those who are cancer survivors, what it would be? Such a great question. I think um, I would say definitely the, more, the, the obvious response is making sure that we are taking care of our body. Um, I mean, I, I say that with all the love I can muster because as women, we, we usually put our, our needs kind of last and that's a big learning. If you've gone through cancer, you realize like, wow, I may have lived my life unknowingly, you know, um, not really putting my needs first. And so the first thing I tell cancer patients is now is your time to transform into the woman you want to be, you know, and the first way we start to show up and show love for self is by nourishing our body and putting love into the food. Okay, so that's like the first thing is <clears throat> connecting with the food, you know, enjoying the way the food makes you feel and the way the power of the food and how it heals our body. So that's the first piece. But also the second piece is, um, and I say this a lot to women, a lot of times when people get cancer, it's because, you know, we, again, maybe we haven't, we've been through trauma. We've had years of, of just running at full throttle and full speed. And, and we've never really given ourselves a chance to pause and be still and to really, you know, tap into our own just feelings and finding our voice again. So I always tell women who are doing, you know, trying to, to move into this new space, you know, take the time you need to slow down, you know, reflect and, and try to find your voice again, find your voice again, be okay with putting yourself first. So those are the two things that I really try to inspire and educate the, the cancer clients, even that I'm helping right now. And, um, you know, make sure you feel it's okay to be selfish and put your needs first. That's wonderful. So uh, what, you're, what you're sharing with us now, that our health as moms should come, should come first because it affects everyone in the family. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Cancer, although it's an it's unfortunate uh, disease, but it could be a wonderful transformation juncture in our life. This, That's right. uh, this is a moment when we realize that we have to make a change and that change has to be a positive one for the sake of those we love, right? 
That's right. Um, and That's right. and I, I would love that every woman who's listening to us now, taking care of yourself is not selfishness. Taking no. care of yourself is, is true love to everyone you care about. Uh, because by having more energy, uh, and it's, 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 it's good for everyone, basically. On that beautiful, beautiful note, I would love to thank you so much for this wonderful interview. And uh, please tell us and tell our audience, how can they find you? Where they can find you? My pleasure. So uh, I am on the internet, of course, on social media, at, on Facebook and Instagram. So um, we can definitely provide those links here. But my website is, of course, www.nutritioncommission.org. Uh, and I also am highly active in uh, Facebook, uh, Nutrition Commission. Um, and I do a lot of uh, live coaching every week. And I also post a lot of yummy recipes and a lot of uh, self-care work and free tips and um, strategies just to help women who are battling illness or who just want to focus on their health and, and turn things around. And I, I put a lot of content out there just to help women feel empowered and uh, start taking healthy action. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've been very generous um, and you are sharing with us uh, some of your freebies. So basically yes. um, uh, very informative and useful materials about nutrition. Could you yes. tell us more about this? Yes, my pleasure. So what I'm going to uh, provide just to help, you know, spark some, some thought and awareness is I'll give a, a one handout, which will be foods to eat. And then of course, the foods we want to um, avoid or, or limit. And that'll give you a little bit of a, a profile around these are the, the great proteins and also some serving sizes. So you can start to think about, oh, okay, this is how much I sh maybe should try to eat. Um, protein. I was eating maybe too much every day. Um, so that'll be something that you, you will find helpful. Um, and then the second one is I'm just going to also provide some, um, a few recipes just to help, you know, again, um, create some, some creativity in the kitchen, some very simple side dishes. And I always just provide Mediterranean style vegetables just so folks can actually um, throw those into their, to their meal planning or dinners um, maybe in this coming week. So I'll also provide that link. These links mean that you'll, you'll hit the link and you'll go in and you'll type your, your name and your email. An email will be sent to you. And then you'll just click that email and you'll have the, uh, the documents there for you to download at that point. And then you can print them out or save them as you like. And they're completely free. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for being so generous. And thank you for being our guest today. It has been really a pleasure and honor to talk to you. We are so love, proud of love, your love, love being here. It was my pleasure. Thank you. We are very proud of your journey and what you've made out of your struggle. Um, and best of luck in your entrepreneurship and nutrition uh, journey coming on. Thank you so much for having me. And it was a real pleasure to be here, especially just to connect with you, but also uh, some of your key members in your site as well. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. You too.